مالك مالك بيبي سما وابو قريبو اسانتي كيزيتو يسا كيزيتو هو اللي هو اورجنايزر ديني سما كيزيتو the website website or something like that no 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 i was just coming up by my coach okay. good evening gentlemen hey peter good evening to you hello how good are you good evening peter i'm fine i'm fine how about you hey. tell me how's the weather there in kenya ah it's our uh, winter it's quite cold <laughs> is it quite okay. cold you can see we we, we in durban In Durban, we sit here. We've got short pants and short sleeves. We, it's not. It's not. Our cold is 17 degrees. <laughs> same here. Same here. How is it? But that's not cold. 17 is no, is it's, hot. It's it's cold for us. Is it cold? 17 cold, cold. cold for you. 19 degrees in, in Kenya. Nairobi. Kenya, we don't we don't <laughs> like below 25. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, okay. That's true. That's true. No, not in in Durban either. In Durban, when it's really cold, they bring out their slops with socks. <laughs> So yes, um, come again. I said in in Durban when it's really cold they wear slops you know toe slops but with socks. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's the coldest that ever becomes. No uh, yeah people stay indoors when it's quite cold. We stay indoors. So yeah. tell me just a little bit about everyone here I see there's quite a few um are we still waiting for a few people to join? Yes yes uh, we we can begin in the next two minutes when people join there's no rush i don't know um george is um, the session structured on a uh, a zoom call that's only 40 minutes or you've got enough time i've got enough i i requested for two hours but we can do less than that no 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 two you. hours is much no nee? we we live in durban yeah, two I hours know, is... i know i just didn't want to go no, back just... and add more time This coach will go to sleep after 45 minutes. Yeah, I know. I understand. They had a, they had a long day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A few minutes more. Let's start. Okay, let's start. So, so just to start off by I would just want to say thank you George for inviting me to come and talk to you guys. Um a little bit about my background if you didn't get the 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 memo. Um I was first or I was studied in the the field of biokinetics. Um and that's more in the medical field. um and uh, i for two years i worked with brain patients so people who always got brain injuries and helped them there and in that intern that i was still playing rugby uh for harlequins at that stage um i got opportunity to obviously to work at the bulls and then i then i completed that for 11 years and then i've been with the sharks for the last nine so so my passion in life has obviously has been sport um i'm still play tennis as many times as i can that's actually my big passion is tennis um and my background is obviously biokinetics and then you can ask jason he knows me a little bit more um i've done every little strength conditioning course you can think of um and the reason i tell you that specifically is because it's there's so much information and it's changing daily the science in our field is massive and you can just do yourself a favor and go into youtube and google um you'll sit there for days um about the information so so why i say that very simply is is that uh, that i'm not an island i'm not like fiji eh and that, that's an island i work with a team of guys uh, in my in my staff i've got about four staff members um and each one of them has a minimum of an honors or a masters degree in a field so i'm i'm literally just a facilitator and today i want to maybe just introduce you guys a little bit of what we facilitate what is strength and conditioning and how you as coaches can maybe implement it into your training sessions because i do believe i i i spoke to some of your um coaches um and i spoke to george and to and jason and i think you've all knowledge about what strength and conditioning is but i think it's it's quite relevant as how does it integrate into my training session on the field or what role does it play when a strength coach is is next to the field or even in the gym because sometimes the coaches are separate there's coaches on the side and they do their own thing and you get the snc on the one side and you get medical on the one side but it is quite important for them to integrate together so that there's a collective and obviously our main goal 
is obviously performance. And to start off with, just to say what is performance in my head, in my space, is obviously they need to be someone that you test, there needs to be improvement, and obviously, or training, and then you need to test them again. So in my field, it's very easy, and it's not, it's not subjective, it's uh, um, our objective, it's we, we test, there's a physical score, and you get a value. So it's literally more science than anything else, and that's where I want to start off with the first slide, is this field of ours in strength and conditioning um, is a field, you can read it there, this is an art guided by science. So it's it, like coaching. It, it, like any coach, you can get all the knowledge that you want from world rugby and coaching courses, but there's an art form to how do I put science and this coaching thing together. It must be together. It must be one amalgamated thing to get a great result at the end of the day. And if strength conditioning and medical and coaching is separate from each other, obviously there won't be a beautiful picture. And I think I love rugby and I love sport. If you look at a, good, a great game, it's almost like an art form. And if we want to create art form, like any art, it needs structure. Structure like any building. If you think about interior designing, there's a wall and inside I can build things. And strength and conditioning is one of those stuff that we can mold it, but there's a bit of a science inside and there's a bit of art inside as well. So, so any, any time, gentlemen, this is a, uh, in my, my mother language is not in English, so I can ask you in Afrikaans. So I know you can ask me probably in French and different other languages. But if there's any questions, please just maybe show by hand um, and we can continue. But if you do want to follow someone, this Pete Bartholomew is an amazing coach. Um, and he, he talks about the science, he talks about the strength and conditioning, but he also talks about the mind. We've only been allowed to really study the mind and how it integrates into S and C. And that's obviously one of the things that I'm kind of studying on into. So just quickly, what is our vision um, and what we want to do? Uh, sorry, I just want to go back. Um, so for us, very simply, is improving athletes through coaches. I think the biggest word used in the world is coach says. So if the coach says it goes. So the, the place I think that improvement should be taken is through the coaches. If you can change the way the coach thinks about something, then obviously it's so much easier to educate the, the athletes out there and obviously they listen to. So education and coaching athletes is our prime goal. We want to be innovative in improving performance. I think that's for us all. That's our major goal on improving performance. Like I said, I described that. And then obviously we want to decrease injuries and improve recovery. I think... Every coach out there, strength coaches or not, that's your part of what you want to do. You want to make sure that you've got athletes who can compete, recover well, so they can obviously play, practice well. And then obviously we want to produce results. I think results just speak for itself. Um, I know you guys spoke last time with Ben um, about culture. Um, and, and obviously winning is a culture, but obviously pr pr producing results is also a culture. Um, so if you look at the next one, very simple. So what we do, very simply, in strength and conditioning is one element of a few that I could discuss earlier. But in our company that we focus on is obviously strength and conditioning is the mid center. But out of those spheres, obviously we not, like I said, an island. We need to look at what the medical side says, just the buyers and the physios and the physical therapists say. And obviously education plays a major role because if you have players on the field, there's just minions or soldiers who just, follow orders when there's something that happens they're not educated enough they can't make proper decisions obviously there's chaos on the field so i think education is vital but in a strength conditioning field education is so vital because at the end of the day the science bit is is a scramble it's chaos so the role of the strength conditioning coach in your sphere should be is to make sense of the science I don't know if that makes sense to you guys. He should be the guy who has got all the signs behind and knows exactly physiologically, psychologically, mentally, nutrition, recovery. He needs to take the signs bit and say, okay, cool, how does it amalgamate so that we can produce performance? Because if he's the guy up and down and he has, doesn't follow science and the science is, is out there, you just need to go and read up about it and get knowledge. He should integrate in training session and Fundamentally, the goal is for you to get results and improve performance. 
So just quickly, what is strength conditioning? So if you look at what we do as an industry and as a job, very simply to say that our first pillar, if you look at the bottom of our house, our pillar is we want to improve movement and we want to improve tissue quality. So if your strength coach is really wise, that will be the fundamental stuff that you focus on is does my, do my athletes train well? So meaning how well is they and efficient is their movements? And then obviously his first goal is, is creating a place where the t- tissue, I mean the muscle, the tendon, the bone, the athlete is obviously is in good quality for you to perform. So that's the foundation of your house. The walls of your house, if you want to put it together, is, is obviously the stuff that you know of. What we call first dimension coaching. Um, so that is strength, conditioning and fitness and running. And we'll discard that a little bit longer. But that's mostly what people think about. But the one that they miss here majorly or currently in the world is mental. Is what effect does the brain have on the ability for the athlete to perform? And there are a few breathing techniques and brain techniques. One of the major things that we're looking into now is brain endurance. So how can we get an athlete to sustain his energy for much longer? Because there's lots of signs that show that fatigue in the athlete is nothing more than a mental thing. So if I can train him for endurance, not just physically, but mentally to endure for much longer, that will improve his quality of performance when he plays his sport. And then lastly, obviously, I think when you train like I do with top athletes, most of them sh- these stuff should have happened while they at primary school, secondary school, high school, maybe tertiary institutions, um, performance, maybe if you're in an under 20 competition, but when you get to a third level or a skilled sport specific practice, these bottom stuff should be second nature. So my question to you firstly is, how well currently do you, is your junior structures in developing a platform and a wall so that when you get to top performance that the ceiling and the roof can be put up and obviously you have a house that's sound and stable. So that is the role of the strength coach if you look at a pyramid structure. I just threw put in this slide to maybe give you some perspective. I don't know if you guys work with ladies as well, but obviously in our industry, it's men and ladies who play rugby. So just a few, and if you look at that first level dimension coaching, there's just a few, and I think you've, if you've done any world rugby course, you would have seen this. I don't know if you guys with a hand up, I've seen this before. If you've done world rugby courses, you'll seen this, and this is quite prevalent. And that is your peak height velocity. It's a peak when obviously the biggest growth of the athlete takes place. But at the bottom, you'll see it's quite important that one of the things that these stuff doesn't kindly tell you is obviously the cognitive and mental and emotional standard of these athletes. So the role of the strength coach is not making sure that these stuff is ticked, okay? And I do want to say as, a, as an interim, I don't think that it only needs to start when it's five years old. I do think you can work on strength, what we call resistance training, with a five, six, seven, and eight year old. You just need an expert to and use science to show you what is needed and how effectively can make him work. So on that note, I just showed you this slide. I know you guys have seen this before. So just quickly to show you, if you look at that same early childhood, mid-childhood, adolescent, and adulthood, just want to show you. So if you look at a year plan or a growth spurt for these kids, the same one we just previously spoke about, it's on a continuum. It means it can happen from very early age to really old age. But I want to say to you that's important is it needs to be tested. So that FMS is a starting point to get the athlete to cycle call. We need to test you to see where you are physically at, how well do you move, how great is your tissue. And then, but that testing doesn't stop even if you're in a professional age. It needs to be continuous right through. And this is sports specific skills. Right? And you can see it's maybe less when they're a little smaller, but it doesn't mean, and there's so many research say that, oh, they shouldn't specialize early or they can't start at certain ages. I want to tell you the more variety and more skill you put into your training sessions, especially in movement, I'm not talking just in passing a ball and kicking a ball, but more the movement variety you give your child in the lesser age and younger age, the easier it is for you to do specific skill when they're a little bit older. Mobility, obviously important right through, 
there is a growth spurt here between those ages that makes it easier. But a big key, and that's my job at the Sharks, that we're currently working with, and maybe for a later date we can discuss this, but agility, gentlemen, is not just getting a ball and someone who has a good step. It obviously needs to take into consideration the environment and the response. But what we found is very simple. It, it doesn't help that I train in what we call closed environments or in open environments. We need both together to teach the athlete how to respond to environments and have the best ability. So there's huge research kindly on agility and how it can be improved. And one of the major ones it obviously can improve is the brain and the eye and the ear and the senses and how we can improve our agility, obviously, through responses. And there's computer programs, there's applications, there's stuff that your strength coaches hopefully will do with your athletes that can help you in that element. Then speed, this is my baby that I do at the Sharks. Um, and, and just to say that there's, and I can keep you busy for, for five hours and it will be a drop in the bucket about speed. There is no, no substitute for speed in any sport. I don't know if you guys agree. So if you're not fast enough, you can't play our sport. And that's not just rugby, that's any sport. Um, important, obviously, is power. Um, and, and I don't know if you guys know, hopefully your strength coach will help you, but obviously power is important. And you'll see, uh, it's written here at the bottom, strength training. Strength training can start, you see it's major there. You can start from two years. It doesn't mean weight training. Strength training. And I always tell the athletes it's so important that you think about it. We, you don't ask a two-year-old not to run. That's strength training. You just need to know what to do and how to train them, obviously, to get the best response. You'll see the hypertrophy. Obviously, getting the muscle bigger is not important for young athletes. But it can be done here from ages 12 to obviously 21 is getting the athlete bigger. But just remember, especially for speed, if an athlete is, is big and heavy, but he weighs too much, he won't be fast. He might scrum well, but that's all he will able to do. Okay. And then endurance is obviously, there's a key element of endurance that the athlete can do. So the question I want to ask, and this is for the coaches specifically, maybe not the SNCs, is how do we bridge the gap? Have you guys heard about a technical tactical model? So very simply saying, in a technical tackle model is to say that if I look at a rugby game, there's four major elements. If you go and Google this technical tactical model, you'll get a variety of stuff. But normally when we train a, uh, in a season, you know, you guys know by now, you have a pre-season or an off-season, a pre-season, a pre-competition season, a competition season, and then hopefully your athletes play in a final. You guys agree? But if you look at the modern game, maybe back for an individual athlete, that's easy because you can pick a game or an event that you want to improve in. But for us in rugby, it's quite hard because we want to win every match, don't we? Most coaches, our coaches want to win every game. So how do we periodize? How do we structure our training sessions so that we win every match? And obviously, the role of the strength coach is to help you to structure your training sessions so you get the best buck for your money. And bridging the gap is one of the elements that we use as a concept called tackle sport or gaps, is using games to condition our athletes. So, uh, okay, someone's mic is on. Do you want to ask a question? Someone wants to ask a question or it was just a fault? Yes, Okay, so the question. do you want to ask a question? No question. Okay, so just to quickly, what elements are obviously important when we think about an athlete in success? Fuzz is one of our athletes that's just shot up from a junior athlete, went through the ranks, is now one of our top players. And obviously strength conditioning is important, a vital one that you mustn't forget, obviously, and that's the role of the strength coaches to make sure and your dietitian that your nutrition and recovery is optimal. And assessing and testing is a vital role in what we do. And obviously, like I said, I think it's vital that your, your coaches and your athletes are educated and trained so they can actually train themselves. Otherwise, it's what we call, it's, there's no mastery or, or autonomy. They, they don't want to do it anymore because we coaches tell us to do. So what does it entail? 
if we put the whole model together, the strength and conditioning a guy in your team needs to be able to give you all these elements in your training sessions or in your week or in your year. You should be able to give you strength or SAQ, what we call it. You need to get the athlete flexible, strength training, conditioning. You need to help you prioritize your timetable. You need to make sure that players are hydrated, they have enough food, they have enough supplements. You need to make sure that they test it. Currently, there's a lot of science in genetic testing, so we can help them to test them genetically. Um, literally, the genetic test that we currently use at the Sharks is we can take stuff in and take a certain vessel of your mouth, and that we can trace to say the call you have either slow twitch fiber or uh, fast twitch fiber or what we call a wild, and we can cater to your nutrition and your training specifically for your genetic profile. I don't know if you guys heard about that before. Have you heard about genetic testing? Obviously, emotional intelligence is important, and then biomechanical testing is also important. And it's one of the elements we do. And we have a company called NPR that remotely goes on sites and they do this for us. And then education. I think you need to be skillful in everything that you need to do, but it needs to be skillful in our, what we call soft skills. So when a strength coach are out there and they are shouting demands, um, that cues, what we call it, needs to be specific to the athlete, but it mustn't be intrinsic, meaning we don't want to get the athlete thinking about, about himself. We want the athletes to build them up. And training education, not just the coaches, but the strength coaches, of how do you say what you do is quite vital in getting the right responses. So if we look at that, what we call the technical tactical model, this is a description of a year planning. So how do we integrate a training session throughout the year? So I think all of you guys have, have you sat down with your strength coaches and worked on a yearly planning before? Gentlemen? Do you have you sit down? Do you have on your team, do you have strength coaches? Yes, we do. That sit down with you, yes, George, yes, and did, do. do they go through your periodization pair programs with you? I don't think uh, they do go through with the SNC coaches. Mm -mm. Not all teams. Okay. Few. So my question will be is how, how do you integrate your training session if your SNC doesn't know what you're going to do next? So the tactical, the, the tactical, the tactical, technical model is an easy model that you and the coach could sit down and then go through the specifics of what you required for your athlete during the training session, but also to get the specific results that you're looking for. So if you look at this model, obviously this is matches in South Africa. Obviously we play most of our matches on a Saturday. When we think about our pre-season sessions, we want to make sure that obviously our game related activities is obviously stipulated and obviously trained from the beginning of, I say we've got 14 weeks to prepare, and we wanna make sure that all our session, and that includes all the stuff that we showed at the top, is integrated into your training, so that when you go through your weeks on cycles of preparing an athlete, that you obviously know that they've done speed, they've done strength, they've done endurance, and they obviously recover to be able to give you the best that you want. So how do we do that very simply? It's very simple. If you look at a, a weekly schedule for the athlete and you work with your strength and conditioning coach, it's vital that he sits down with them and says, cool, I can only talk about the strength stuff that we go through, but to give you an idea, per week, so say this is a sun as a rest day and obviously Saturday is your game day, then we should use, obviously look at a recovery day maybe on a Monday and some light aerobic activities strength training for the guys on the on uh, on um, Tuesday, endurance on a Wednesday, speed and specific skills on a Thursday, and there will obviously activation on a, on a Friday. But the reason I show you coaches is just to say that obviously you see at the top, it must be in conjunction that if I recovery day, it means that I need to look at technical and tactical stuff that's important for my team to correlate what the strength coach is doing on the field or in the gym. Does that make sense? So yeah. if, he, if he is doing aerobic work or what we call anaerobic lactic work and he wants to train at game speed, making sure it's like, a, like a, a captain's practice on the field 
It makes sure that the activities that you as a coach want to implement need to be coincide with what your strength coach has planned for the season to optimize during the game. The same is obviously important. So what he does in the gym needs to correlate what they do on the field. So we can't have a gym session and we do legs in the gym and the coach is outside as a fitness session. It, it doesn't correlate. It doesn't work together. So it needs to be integrated that the coaches and the strength coaches work together to obviously optimize so that at the end of the day, what, what we're showing you here is the key is we want to win every game. We can't bear our eyes that in certain areas we do strength and for four weeks you do strength and four weeks you do speed. In every session right throughout the week, we have one of our major elements, but it has to be in conjunction with what the coaches sessions are so that we can optimize our training for the week. Okay, so if you look at a session, just for a day session, so this is obviously the role of the s and and I'll show you how it incorporates it. So if you think about the strength conditioning uh, coach, he should be able to get the base of the athletes going before the training session start, up to what we call medicine ball training, should happen every time before you have a training session. So if you have two, two training sessions in a day, it means what we call pillar preparation and movement preparation should be done for your athletes. So if you have a 45 minute training session on the field, the athletes actually should not take 30 minutes or so to warm up on the field. It should be done before. And if when you go on the field, you just want to integrate the movement pattern and obviously train. And the same is true for your gym sessions and obviously for your field sessions. So I want to ask you coaches and you can maybe apply. We'll go back to the slide, but do you do this? Do you give your strength coach enough time to warm up your athletes so that your training session, that 45 minutes that you have on the field is optimized so that you can train the whole week if you look at the week? So that every training session during the week is optimal so you can watch, win the game. And unfortunately, most co coaches don't even know about the top stuff here. They don't know in the weekly planning, this is how a day should look when I prepare my athletes to perform. So overall, just what is our focus for our coaches? To say that obviously the aim is to find training exercises the task, the team will do what is expected for them in a game. So if you look at our periodization model, if you look again, this model is structured not by the SNC, it's in conjunction to what the coaches want for the game so that we can win the game. That's why they are there. They are there to help you to structure your training session so that you get the best back for your athletes to optimize their performance. The second one is obviously to improve the athletes by quality and organized goals. So what, what that means is if you have a player and you work them very hard on a Monday, it means they won't be that effective on the Tuesday and the Wednesday. So with the SNC coach, you need to con work together so that your training sessions per week is scheduled, that you get the best quality out of your athletes in every training session and obviously your organizational goals that you owe each one, your matches that you're supposed to win, and obviously plan the final if that's who you need to be. And then lastly, obviously training means improving the play or the game. So one of the elements that we're currently looking at is a thing called what we call um, tackle sport. And tackle sport has four major elements in it. And so every training session that we go through in every training organizing we do, we have certain games that we play that the athletes are evaluated. So every training session is fun because there's a game element. And that's actually where we want to look at the athlete. We want to see is how well do they move? How well effective are they? And do they, can they do the skills that require for them to win that match, that game for that session? And it might be four different games during one session. The second thing is obviously is activities. So we want to break down that game to certain small activities to say that I have a defense activity for the day or a line break activity or a, a, a kick chase activity. Then we want to break it down to, to um, 
practices. So certain practices that we give them to say that, okay, cool, we can see that you're struggling in that session, maybe with a 2v, 3v game or a kicking game or a return play game or an up and down game. And then lastly, one would break down it into a small skill. So for saying that we struggle to see that the athlete struggles to pass to his left, how we can correct that. And at the end of the training session, we go back to a game and make sure that the athlete plays a game again and see if there was improvement in that training session that he implemented. So the GAPS model, remember we spoke how do we grow big to the gap, is using practices obviously through games to structure our SNC model so that we get the best benefit from our back um, when we obviously work with our athletes. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. That's me. So maybe there's some. It's quick and short, George. I don't know if there's maybe some. Uh, obviously, will be some questions. It's a lot more than when we started off, now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Cool. So quickly tell me what gentlemen, what is your what is your thoughts? Is there any questions? Yes, sir. Question. Yes. Mike. Um, uh, personally I develop my programs, strength and conditioning programs, according to the game model of the coach. Yes. Uh, you've spoken about the technic te technical and tactical model. Yes. How, 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 how can I get integrated with the game model? Because tactical and technical model means long term. I see it as long term, but game model is, is, is for the next game or for the mm -hmm. next tournament. Yeah, so if you, if, if you go back to the slide, you'll see when you sit down with your strength coach, his role is to see as look at the, the structure, not just for that specific week. He needs to look at when you want to play in the final. That's he periodizes his timetable, obviously for the term or a competition that you're in. Okay, Does, is, do you understand that? So that's a technical tactical periodization model. But the model for years was there's a linear growth. So we will start maybe with high volume work in the beginning and low intensity. But the problem is you don't in in our modern game we want to win every match. So you need to start with the athletes at a high intensity and a high volume to adapt them to that certain element. So you need to break down your weekly structure, not in a full term, like a, a, a full season. You need to break down in a week. So every week in every training session, I will have a little bit of speed, a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of power. All the elements that the SSC need to bring in need to be in your model per training session and that obviously is scheduled during your week and you can schedule it during a day does it make sense Mike yes sir it does make sense the second question is hello hello can you yes I can hear the second question is no, uh, it's uh, sometimes it's, it's a bit it's a bit hard to inc incorporate uh, game stuff in your conditioning programs because of uh, various reasons. Uh, things like fitness, fitness on the ball, things like uh, passing fitness, uh, running on the ball, fit, fitness running on the ball. It's a bit uh, difficult to incorporate them. How do you do that outside the, the coaching time, the, ta the, the coach's time? Yeah. How do you do that? How do you incorporate that in the program? Now, Mike, Mike, I, I actually want to sit down with you and I think that's vital that you and your strength coach sit together because what we do is obviously we take the coach and say, okay, cool, he wants to work on a defense element for the day. The way I manipulate the result that I want as an NCC coach is by working work to rest ratios in conjunction with a coach. So say, say for instance, my goal for today was to work on endurance. I'll tell the coach before and listen up today, our work to rest ratios will be one to one or less than the activity. Or if it's in a speed day, I'll take a call, coach, we have a longer little bit of a break. We can have a high intensity activity, say for two, three minutes, we have a bit of a break. So work rest ratios is a great element to help in your game model to manipulate the results that I want. Does it make sense? Yes, sir. 
doesn't help. Yes, it helps. Uh, yes, it helps. So I if you have it. a training session and you want to work on maybe defensive skills for the day and the SNC's goal for that day is maybe endurance, then he can help you to work out your work rest ratios. And obviously we know endurance is one-to-one -one, and every element of that day that you train will be a one-to-one -one work rest ratio. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yes, Jason. I was just pizza. I've got three questions. <laughs> yes. Um, first, uh, in this day and age, um, what advice can we give the coaches in terms of separating what they find online between science and opinion dressed as science? Um, okay. Second question is the can you explain to the coaches the importance of load monitoring? Um, okay. Because in Kenya sure. we've got sevens. Um, National sevens, national fifteens, and club rugby all mixed into one um, yeah. training session on Sundays for national teams. And then, thirdly, could Vessel maybe also chat to the coaches about the ETA online platform, if that's possible? We, we will do that. Sorry, just just that first question again. First question is how how can we advise the coaches on separating uh, science from opinion dressed as okay. as fact? Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. So, so just to quickly to start off with, uh, gentlemen, the, if you go to any science, if it's not backed through research, meaning it's not a fly by night, something on web that you read um, and it's someone's opinion, I will be very wary to take it as science. Science is normally something that was studied and they will be seen in any scientific journal. There'll be a reference of not one, at least, if it's a master's degree, at least 10 to 15 references. If it's a, a doctor's degree, more than 20 minimum of references of other people who have stipulated the same model that they have done. If you go to Instagram or TikTok or YouTube or Facebook to get your information, you are going to be in trouble because very simple principles are very simple. It's like gravity. Even if you, you don't believe it, it's going to follow you, okay? Because gravity is going to make you fall if you climb out of a tree. You just need to let go, okay? But methods, there's a thousand and one methods to do something. So methods is not the key. You need to be, and then I always ask the question, if a guy shows you a YouTube clip or a Facebook page or a whatever, the question to my mind will always be is, where did it start? And where is he going with it? Doesn't make sense, Chase. Yes? So research will always have a starting point and will normally elaborate to a finished point. Like I said in the beginning, what is performance is something as a start where I can measure and there's progression or activity and then I can measure again and there was improvement. The problem with all these hubs or methods, it's a quick fix method, but it doesn't have sustainability over a period of time. And when you test it again, it's normally not improved. Okay, that's the first question, does it help? The second thing obviously is um, about monitoring your athletes. So there's very scientific ways and very expensive ways to monitor your athletes. The simplest way to determine if your athletes are training and how well they're training and how hard they're training, and that's not just physical but mental and cognitive, is a normal RPE scale. So even at the Sharks, we still use it. We've got catapult and we've got so many expensive stuff that you pay that you can monitor athletes load. But the simplest way for you to do it non-effective or very effective, but very cheap is you ask the athlete on a rate of scale, how hard was the training session? And obviously you need to plot that. So 10 is it was very hard and one, it was very easy. And you take the time your session was and you plot that over three weeks We've got a, uh, I'll, I'll maybe let you guys on the link and I'll send it to George. Then we can work out what we call your chronic ratios, your acute and chronic ratios to see are your athletes under-trained or are they over-trained? Because for under-training, obviously they, they're unfit. But if they're over-trained, the symptoms will look exactly the same as unfit. But the difference is it'll take you three to six months to get them back to their original state. So overdoing it is much worse than underdoing it. 
So very simple. You can use very scientific ways through uh, GPS or through accelerators or serial ROMs. Um, but the cheapest way is RPE. You can get it on Google. It's online. Very simple, a scale. And then take the time that your session is long, your duration of your sessions. And that includes, just to say quickly, I don't want to elaborate too much, but that just includes not just your field sessions, it should include your gym sessions, your speed sessions, your flexibility, durations of total sessions on the day that's monitored on your RB and your duration. That thrown into a nutshell will monitor your players through the session that they've done. And then after three weeks, you can work on a plot and a scale and then we will be able to pinpoint and tell you that your athletes are under-trained, over-trained, or they right on par to get you to go. And if you give me just a second or two, I'll ask Vessel just to quickly elaborate on our education bit and how do we, obviously, we can educate your coaches about strength and conditioning a little bit more. Vess? Okay. Gentlemen, just um, to obviously elaborate what's... Peter just said there, you may just unmute yourself, he's behind me here. It's that um, what Peter and I are very passionate about is obviously developing athletes and improving the, through the coaches, which means the coaching education model is very important for us. So within our business that we, I'm involved in as well, ETA College, we obviously look at all the elements that make a coach better. So through our sports coaching um, initiatives, we've identified the number of elements that coaches need to work on and to improve on in order to deliver better results. And obviously for us, it's important to develop strength, the speed, the agility, the um, plyometric, all that knowledge. Each of those components are so important. Uh, apolo apologies, Wessel. Yeah. Wessel, yeah. apologies. Okay. Uh, pardon, Russell, uh, just to cut you short, uh, you have an echo in the background, meaning you are, there are two devices logged in into this meeting. So you are well, my. Okay. Please go on. George, can you hear it now? Yeah, perfect. perfect. There we go. Okay. So, as Pete was saying, is that it's important for us to, uh, within what we do at Sports Coach Global and then with one of our partners, ETA Cottage, is looking at the overall coach development and looking at all the components that make that coach better. Because obviously you as a coach have a huge influence in how the athlete perform and the athlete develops over an extended period of time. So with Sports Global, we break down every little component that a coach needs to know and then we obviously investigate into that elements and we train the coaches up into those detail. And like I said before, with the echoes, you obviously didn't hear all of that, is the, the speed and agility, the strength and conditioning, the um, uh, agility movement, uh, all those components, we work within speed and agility and management of all of that. So what we do is we obviously put a model together, we assist coaches in that model, and we obviously help them to develop that model the best that they can in order to then get the results that they want in the long run. And for us, obviously, it's very important with the development of the athlete as well and, and obviously over a long-term period. And we do this through different short courses, through different um, what we call CPD programs. And these short courses and CPD programs is all building blocks towards one of our bigger qualifications, obviously, that just helps coaches to develop into diplomas, uh, graduates, with obviously our education partners that we have in South Africa. Okay, Thanks, there we go, George, um, to give a bit of insight into that. Do you guys Thanks, have Jason. a platform at EA that we could maybe share with the coaches on this side? Say again, Joseph. Um, do you guys maybe have, I can't remember ETA, it's been a very long time. Um, do you guys have um, online platforms that we can maybe direct our coaches in? Um, yes, maybe, we do. Please. If I, if yes, we do, Jace. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, obviously for a different discussion, I'll sit maybe with you and George and discuss. But literally what the whole concept is that you can still do certificates, degrees or, or diplomas 
uh, on short courses online and then build up your CV and build up your curriculums or build up your own CV so you can write up and say, cool, I can do a diploma in SNC or a diploma. I don't know if it's a degree at this stage, this to a degree if it's obviously filled all your elements and requirements for that course and then obviously you can build it up up to something higher, maybe a diploma or a degree. Does it make sense? Okay, any other questions, gentlemen? Uh, just a question. It's Mike. Yes, uh, yes Mike. So uh, my questions, are, I have two questions. First is how do you define, this is from a SNC perspective, how do you define uh, collision? And how do you manage to get the right amount of collision, especially in training that mimics the game? in terms of also the duration of uh, training, because sometimes the coaches can push the training session for two hours or even more. How do you get to hit the right levels without doing too much? Yeah. Well, Michael, just to ask you, or, or ask you one, or to answer your question very quickly, obviously if you write and you look at collision, it has to do with G-force. It has to do with the speed and the weight that the athletes collide into each other. So if you go to the um, World Rugby Passport site, and if you've been to the World Rugby Passport site, their level two coaching curriculum, um, if you ever uh, get a, the pre-curriculum, is a great source, and they've got great research about collisions. They tell, can tell you for sevens and for 15 men rugby exactly how many collisions in average is in the game, and they can obviously tell you how many is required for athletes. I think at this stage we're looking between 13 and 14 collisions in a major game of 15. And obviously it's a little bit higher um, for sevens. So, and it depends on the position that they play, Mike. So if a Ford, a Ford obviously takes more collisions because there's malls and scrum involved. Where a backline player, not so many collisions, but the force is sometimes a bit higher because they obviously run a bit faster. Does that make sense? So, so firstly, collision is obviously dependent on G-force and currently through research, there's a lot of re research. You can actually go and Google collisions and the G-forces. And I know for specifically the rated from above 7G as like a, a low collision and above 10 G-force is normally uh, one of the high impact forces and obviously that's the dangerous ones. So your second question is how do you train it? Again, with your strength coach, I would first go and sit down and work out what is our demands of our game. So maybe look at your, your sessions, take a video analysis, sit down with your video guy and say, okay, cool, how many sessions or how many collisions do we have in our game as an average? And then specifically try and incorporate it in your weekly training sessions that you mimic the same stuff that you'll do in your game. It makes sense. So if I know I have 25 collisions in a, in a match, I'll try and build up my weekly program that I at least do minimum of 25 sessions or collision sessions in a day. If you look at most coaching structures, what they kind of do, they some do there's 25 in a day and they do every day they do 25 or 500 full plays, tackle, and think the kid's going to develop. You're actually building, like I said, there's a major difference between over training and under training. But your SNC, if you look at the demands of your game, can periodize in the game model what is required per session, obviously what's required for the whole week. Does it help, Mike? Yeah, that, that helps. It's only that uh, we don't have uh, GPS, so it's more of a video analysis uh, that we can use. M Mike, what, uh, video session, but if you can video clip your training sessions or your games with a phone, and you sit on your phone even and you monitor your phone and say, cool, look at my props. They had 10 collisions for this game or they had 15 collisions. And then you go back in the week and say, okay, cool, my props. We're going to make sure that there's five scrums. That's high collision contact for you. We're going to have 10 scrums in the week. We're going to have 15 tackles in a week. Then you can work a weekly schedule and you work a whole term of how many tackles my athlete's supposed to be in a week. So video, GPS, catapult, there's so many ways you can do it. But the key in green is duration. And obviously is how did the athletes rate it? That's quite important because in the beginning they'll struggle and they'll plot it over a period of time. 
So what you can also do, Mike, that can help you is build up, maybe if you know the demands of your game, is build a checklist that you or the coach could check during the game to see how many collisions did they actually do compared to the original statistics that you have. And then it will create a mean, it will create a plus or minus, and obviously those average you can use for your training sessions in the week. Thank you for that. There's a question. Most teams abuse recovery drills mostly isn't done appropriately. What do you recommend? Sorry, I just want to read that again quickly. Uh, most teams abuse recovery drills mostly isn't done appropriately. What do you recommend since some cause certain injuries later? Okay, so if I understand it correctly, you're saying that the recovery drills are not done correctly and that obviously leads to obvious injuries. Is that Ali? Ali? Yes, it's Ali Shere. Ali, Ali Shere, is that, is that your question? That the athletes don't do the recovery strategies appropriately and then obviously that leads to obvious injuries? Yeah, apparently I was, I was asking. Most of the many recovery drills are not done correctly. So I would I'd like you to comment which, which drill you, you really like to, uh, at, at least to perform. Because most times they're not done correctly after the game. Okay. So. I, think, I, I think obviously if you sit down with strength coaches, there is a variety of things they can do to help a recovery only. But I do agree with you. Um, and I think now most of the time because they never taught, I think it's vital that the coaches and the strength coaches and the athletes go through education to teach them first why is it important to do it. I think the why is so important. If they see the value of why it is important and then take them through that. Well, I've seen with our senior players at the Sharks, we progressively take them through a regime of a variety of recovery strategies from ice baths to cold, to hot and cold showers, to compression garments, to massage, to nutrition, to swimming pools, to active recoveries, to there's a variety of stuff. We take them through them all. And then we literally sit them down and say, okay, cool. which one did you feel was worked the best for you to recover optimally? Obviously we've got certain elements like massage and recovery bath and ice bath that we prefer. But the laser research shows there that even compression garments has a major influence on limb training and recovery. So there's a variety of things you can do, Ali. I think education is key, and but you need to take your athletes through that education and take them through the sessions to find out which ones work the best for them. And then obviously after when they're a little bit older, they'll pick the ones that are more effective for themselves. I hope that helps. Did it help you answer your question? It helps to answer my question. And secondly, uh, Sorry, I didn't hear that. Ali, just repeat that. I, I want to ask a question. Likely, mostly in Kenya, they, they have a, many rugby games, um, many training from Monday to Thursday. So sometimes they cannot they cannot do all, all the all, all what the NCC would like them to recommend them to do. So you find them lagging on, 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 on Saturday game day. So what could be the reason? So, so if I understand it correctly, so you're saying that they don't train every day? Um, they the athletes don't? Day. Yeah. Some, they don't some. train every day, so they can't get all the elements that the SNC want in the weekend? Yeah. Okay, my question to you is, is all your SNC sessions structured just for the field? Because obviously what the work that the SNC should be is in the gym. They can do separate speed sessions. They could do separate stairs, um, flexibility, recovery, range of movement. There's a variety of stuff they can do without being on the field. Yeah, they shall do they shall do some separate in the SNC, but not but but not, not, not every day, just once once a day. I I um Ali, I I actually disagree with you. What if you look at our athletes? We train at least three times a day. It depends on where, where do you coach, Ali? Which, are you at, at a primary school or are you at a... No, I'm not... Where I'm do not you coach? coach? No, I'm not a coach. I'm just a referee and a medical doctor. Oh, okay. 
No, well, if you if you look at our current model that we work, our athletes try we at least try and treat, train at least three times a day. That will include a strength training or gym training session. And I'm obviously talking about the professional setup now. They have at least a field session every day. And in between, we will either have massage, we obviously have recovery, we have nutrition. Um, we follow, follow an undulated periodization model. So we will obviously train Monday, Tuesdays, we'll have a Wednesday as an off day. And that off is normally recovery and recovery strategies and mobility. Train a Thursday, have a captain's on a Friday, that's normally just one training session. And then obviously a match day on a Saturday. So, so we currently, um, we train more than one time a day, not even just a week. So we recommend they do more because obviously the demands of the game is so high. If you're only going to train once or twice a week, um, the body can't adapt to the forces and the collisions needed. So they, that, that'll lead to injuries and overuse. Uh, that, was, that was the thing that I was most time I, I, I'm experiencing them at, on the game day. Front kick player having some injuries and some has, have some, some plastic my muscle, my muscle, my muscle, my muscle, yeah, no, the, the problem is they're doing too little, uh, Ali. So they should at least train what we currently do as least on an undulated model and obviously our game model. We train three times a, uh, a day, most of the days, Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays are off, Thursdays are two training sessions, Fridays are one, and obviously Saturday is a game day. So your athletes is undertrained. That's why you're getting injuries because the players aren't doing enough. And the SNC coach, you should sit down with them and plan well. Look at the demands of the game and then go back to the drawing board and say, cool, if I want them to perform, I need to do requirements during the week so they can adapt to the requirements for the game. Um, Peter? Yes, Dominique. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Peter. It's a fantastic um, presentation. I loved it. Uh, Thank you. But I think the, the, the question that is not being asked, yeah, that, but that is on everyone's mind uh, at the moment, um, is that the, the question of time? Uh, we, we don't uh, uh, even here the even on the national team or the the, the, the Premier Club Rugby um, and uh, and the, and the lower leagues, we have very very little time with the players. Yes, that, that's the yep. main problem. That, that's the main problem. So, uh, how, uh, what, what we are trying to find out now, uh, I think from the last few questions. Uh, what, what the guys are try, try to ask is um, how, how do you maximize the little time you have with the players yeah, to, 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 yeah. to, to, to improve the boys and the girls? You see, Dominique, the, the, my, my concern is if, if your question is time, is what is your time allocated to? So if you look at the proper structure, and I, I don't have it as a PowerPoint, but I can, I can try and draw it for you as a pyramid. If you look at your training session, how you structure your training session per day, it should be structured that all the elements of what you want to require in that hour or two hours that you have should be enough to allocate enough training facility or training adaptation to get the demands what you require. The problem is if I go in in a session and it wasn't planned, like most coaches don't, they plan for their little bit of rugby, then obviously there's not a lot of time. But to give you an example, so when we start a training session at the Sharks, we obviously give the athletes before the training session start, they go through pillar preparation and move a prep to make sure that they're warm because that's the issue. If I spend a half an hour to get them warm before they're on the field, I miss half an hour of time. Okay, so warm up before the session start is the responsibility of the SNC coach and they need to be warm before the session start. Then... You saw their medicine ball and plyometrics in that pyramid I showed you. That is to make sure that they are strong enough. So if my element for the day is strength training, I could use the warm up that 15 minutes of a day that I can do plyometrics and medicine ball work to get them strong enough for requirements during the session, especially for a club. The third one is obviously is speed. Then I need to work, warm up and make speed. And then speed training, if I do it every day, it can take me 15 minutes. And there's a variety of elements. Like I said, what we do. What we do at the Sharks, we use 10 minutes every day for speed, but we use obviously five days in the week. That means if you look at the session, it gives you at least 45 to an hour of rugby every time you train. 
And if you structure it well enough with the SNC coach and he works, to, he helps you with your work to rest ratios, that you'll see that ESD that was part of the end slide, it's called energy system development. It means I can train fitness as part of my rugby block if I structure it well enough to work on my work and my rest ratios. So your training session per day, if you're a club player, shouldn't be longer than two hours because you're working, then it's working overwork. But if I structure it well enough, I can get strength, speed, fitness, and my rugby in all in a training session. You just need to sit and plan it properly, Dominic. So well, maybe what we should do one day is sit down with George and I'll help you guys. How do we plan a training session to get the best back for your money? Yeah, yeah, uh, that would be fantastic. But if you can sneak, squeeze all of that into eight hours a week or six hours a week, super. Well, that's just going to add here to what I obviously looked at the comments and I'm going to add that one of your uh, one of your gentlemen noted that most of your clubs, probably 99% of them, have only three days a week of training. So that is important, obviously, that Pitt can guide you guys then on that element. How do you maximize those three sessions a week? And obviously, most of those sessions is probably about two hours long because that's what you'll get maximum out of the players. You don't want to go longer than that. But then to be very clever with your planning in those two hours that the rugby coach, the coach itself, feels he gets enough time. Then you as the SNC or the strength coach also have enough time. And that's why we talked about it earlier is how do you incorporate the technical, tactical model into one session to, to address all those elements in, in your session that you have. And then obviously what's very important as well is that your players should take responsibility away from the field as well. Because those three sessions mostly are going to be taken up into game scenarios, into um, functional work, game-related activities, functional strength and game-related strength components, and obviously biomechanical work and those kind of speed work they could do by themselves, you know, outside the time with you. And that's where your education and your education of your players are very important. And that's very important, gentlemen. I'm just going to add it there is that your role as a coach, your role as, as someone who's working with your players, fundamentally is to educate them as well. You have to educate them. You have to teach them how to do this independently away from you because you will not be able, because of the game being not a professional in Kenya or obviously financially not viable for all the guys to play professional, you have to invest in educating your players so that when they're away from you, they can function by themselves and they grow and they take autonomy for their own improvement as well. So no, right on that, yes, Dominique, I think um, vital. And again, I don't know your structure as well. So like um, Vessel said, if there's only three times a week, it's enough, but because that's obviously what you have, but it's not enough to adapt to the requirements of the game. So there have to be a space where they take ownership themselves. And obviously you need the guidance of someone with the right science and the right education to help them through the process. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that helps. No, it, it helps a lot. Uh, in fact, uh, thanks so much, uh, Wessel, to, to have put it so eloquently. That's exactly what you wanted, on, um, we're asking here. Cool. Thanks, Dominic. Anyone else? Hey, I think mine is just a comment. Uh, my name is Jeffrey. Yes, sir. Um, and, and, and it touches on what Jason has said. I think that the biggest uh, um, issue that comes in terms of the coaches maybe colliding with the SNCs is load is not defined properly. Load for most people is just, if you say running, they'll say it's a load. But load can be defined in very many ways. There's metabolic load, there's neuromuscular load, there's structural system load. So if the SNC understands this kind of uh, difference between the loads, it's easy for him now to incorporate it with the coach and, uh, you know, get whatever they need in a session. And uh, secondly, also, um, the annual plan is good. Yes, it's, it's, um, it's tied to your game demands and all that. But also the annual plan gives you um, a basis of what your sessions will be like because it also borrows from your assessments. What kind of weaknesses that you get from your players, so that uh, you give them prominence in your in your in your daily plan? So, Jeffrey, you are so right. To understand it. Yeah, 
And, and that's why it's so important, Jeffrey, that again, I started the conversation by saying we're not an island. I think some of the coaches out there, you're trying to do this thing all by yourself. Um, or maybe it is all that you've got and you are the strength coach and the coach and the medical and the doctor and the whatever. But it's so vital to, to get people around you that knows the field, that can help you to how to structure it well. Um, and then again, that's why I think, again, thank for George for setting this up. I think this is maybe a step in the right direction to obviously help you guys because um, this is how we learn. If we bounce ideas of each other, and we obviously we've been in the field for now for 19 years, we can help you how to structure your training sessions to get the best value for your athletes, but also to prevent injuries. And then if you if you monitor the stuff, like I said, Jeffrey, we currently obviously use science. We can use your cell phone to monitor your sleep, to monitor the guy's soreness, to monitor the their, their muscle soreness, to see if they're getting sick, to monitor the heart rates. And that can all be remotely done for, for your athletes. It means before they get to the training session, you can have a log of everything that they need to do. And you can pinpoint the athletes who's over training and not under, under, or under training. So the science is there, the knowledge is there. You just need to have the ability to sit down either with a professional or sit down, use a coach and ask the guys around you to help you to, to structure your team sessions or your team cohesion or your staff to get the best value for your athletes. Thanks for that, Jeffrey. Anyone else wants to comment or want to ask a question? Um, Peter, um, yes. just, we just need to, um, I'd like you to place a bit more emphasis on the importance of the load monitoring and, and player welfare. Um, like when we spoke on the phone, um, the mortality rate in Kenya is extremely high. Um, people dropping dead of heart, heart problems, um, people dropping dead with concussions, um, and, and these are things that can be avoided if, if the, the coaches themselves understand the importance of monitoring their players individually. Um, and then secondly, maybe if you could, I don't know if you guys have been working with PUP or um, PAP. Um, yeah. what, what's your thoughts and experiences on that? Because it's obviously something both George and I have been talking about and are looking at implementing yeah. on game day. So, so firstly, just to say, Jess, I think we've, we've, We've elaborated on the monitoring systems. Um, you can either use technology. The best and the cheapest way to monitor your athletes, gentlemen, is very simple, right? The perceived excision and load. That's the cheapest way if you're a club guy. If you want to go the expensive route, you need to look at Catapult. You, look, you need to look at there's many applications you can use. Literally, we currently at the Sharks, we use a, a Google app that we created ourselves. And I'll send you the link. And in that link, obviously, we look at how well did the athlete sleep? How was the training the previous day? What is your like perceived excision? Um, what is his heart rate when he woke up? What is obviously this heart rate availability thing that we're looking at? We're looking at load for the previous day. We're looking at muscle soreness. We're looking at stiffness. There's a variety of stuff that you can do. And it literally takes the athlete five minutes to click it on a cell phone. And he sends the results through to you. And then we re will red flag you as a coach to say, cool, listen up, right, have a look at this athlete, the training session of the previous two, three days were too much. And there's obviously a chronic rain and acute ratios that we can work out specifically per athlete to know if there are some dangers and the signs are out there to say that which ones are, which ones are not. So I think that element is covered. Um, on your second question, just say that again, Jay, sorry, I, I try to write it down, but I forgot. Um, I just wanted to know um, what your experiences were and what your thoughts are on. Uh, oh, on yeah. Uh, okay. So, so very quickly, we've we've been experimenting with pop for quite a while. When we started at this in two thousand and one at the Bulls, we didn't call it pop. We just knew that we needed to stimulate the central nervous system with the athletes before we start a training session. So, if you look at the video or the uh, powerpoints I showed you, if you follow those pillar per, that we said in pillar preparation movement preparation and integration of the elements of the movements that you're going to use during the training session. And you get kinetic linking going through either weightlifting or medicine ball or speed drills. That actually is implementation of the pup principle. It means it stimulates the central nerve. It stimulates the requirements at the force and velocity required for the game or for the activity that would be needed. And there, but there's a hundred and ways methods again, Jace, that you can activate it. I think for, for this purposes, for the coaches to know that 
um, the best way is if you follow a progressive manner that you can teach the athlete through, if before they start a training session that you need to be warm in the muscles, you need to be in the tendons and the ligaments and the nervous system. Um, if you follow the normal typical ramp program that they normally explain for most SNC coaches, it's a great guideline that can guide you on the way to warm the athletes. But that's maybe more a technical question for just SNC department there. Any other questions, gentlemen? Any Does lady anyone... here who has a question? Say, uh, say again, Ali? Yeah. There are ladies in this uh, meeting, so I'm just asking if they have a question. Okay. Anyone? Anyone yes, else? George? All happy. Hello, I'd like to emphasize on, on something. Yes. I'd like to emphasize on something. Who's talking? Motu? I think it's John Bosco. Yes, please go ahead. No, 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 it's not me. Sorry. Some, oh, someone is no, asking no. a question. To be Moto Williams. Moto, did you ask a question? Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. They had Sema. Oh, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Tom Chalova, uh, joining in from Zambia. Um, Excellent. Hello. Yes, we yes, can, we hear, can you. hear you. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad to be part of uh, this uh, uh, this experience. Uh, thank you for letting me in. Uh, my question is, uh, whose duty is it to determine whether the players have had too much? Is it uh, the responsibility of the head coach or is it that of the SNC? Thank you. Um, just to, to ask you a question, firstly, is to say that I think we're privileged that we have a team of guys making a collective decision. Um, I think if you're a lone coach and you're in a club, you will fulfill that role as a head coach in the SNC. But in our environment, we obviously sit down. The head coach always have the primary say because he's the head coach. He will take responsibility for what is decided. But I think a, a, a wise head coach will sit and ask his staff because they're expert in the fields. to so ask them, listen up, how much is enough? And I think to start off with, you should say that what was planned ahead of time should be kept to. So if we know, for instance, like uh, this week with the Sharks, if we train, we know that if we're working on about 12,000 kilometers um, for this week, we know that every training session needs to be allocated to fill that 12 kilometers that we need to run for that specific week. And every training session is allocated a certain amount of training hours or distance. Um, but again, obviously, we've got technology how to monitor it. But I think it should be a collective decision. But at the end of the day, the head coach is the head coach, and he will take responsibility for the athletes if they're overtrained or undertrained. But the responsibility for load and keeping the coach informed, obviously, is the SNC's job. I hope that helps. Yeah. It did. It sure does. Thank you. Any other questions? Very tough over here. Okay, Peter, I have a question. My name is John Bosco. Yes, John. I can see on this group we've got uh, quite a number of school coaches. And the school yes. coaching environment is quite unique, especially in Kenya, where, of course, they emphasize a lot of education, I mean, academic programs. Mm -hmm. There's also a question of thin, a thin staff. Okay, yeah. you, you address the question of time. But again, yeah. there's, a, there's a question of a thin staff. Most of the time, the school coach is all by himself. Yeah. So what kind of advice do you have to, to school coaches, how they can integrate their training programs and, and make sure that uh, players are covered in terms of SNC? John, it's, it's not just in your country. It's a, it's a problem in our country because unfortunately, most coaches coach the way they were coached. So if they were coached a certain way, that's the way they're going to coach their athletes. So my only and best advice, John, will be is, is, Link up with someone like us in Sport Coach that we can give you the education 
we can certify in certain elements and sphere conditioning or the best advice is, is to link with someone that you know who knows a lot about the athletes especially about their physical development i think bigger the issues currently in school is exactly that that the coach is responsible for everything and he's an island on himself so he's a strength coach the medical doctor the physio the bio the principal the everything we we i don't think it's needed the technology and the assistance is outside there i think you just need to be able to to grasp the hand and give a hand and say listen please help me to assist me so that i can get the best benefit for my athletes because at the end of the day it's not john it's not about the player or about the coach and about the trophy it's obviously about that young player that we want to maintain not just to play rugby for school but obviously to play for your national side one day as well so if there's a long term athlete plan and obviously most strength and conditioning as the coaches will have that plan you could work out a schedule that doesn't just benefit you but it will benefit all of the coaches so if you look back at that graph we showed you on it we are showed you the snc model in the beginning and there was the medical staff and there was testing and there was education and training remember that model we showed you that obviously it incorporates everything that the snc staff could help you with to allocate you to make a better decision at the end of the day so you're not alone it might feel sometimes that the school coach is alone because it's they take all the responsibility but the resources are out there so even we'll give the link to george and whoever you can always do short courses through us and obviously get in quick or you can link to people who know and they can help you to develop your coaching strategies and your snc strategies for your school thank you very much i hope that helps john hello can you hear me peter Definitely. yes i can mota all right so thank you very much for the wonderful presentation um over training is one factor that uh, maybe leads to most of the injuries especially in players yeah. can you hear me yes i can hear you okay so thank you so what is uh, maybe can you give us an overview of your week in season week in regards to principle of overload and uh, principle of uh, tapering so remember this is in season you are trying to avoid uh, overtraining as well as stadium for this player so what can you advise us maybe can you give us an overview in, uh, in regards to the principle of overload and the uh, principle of uh, tapering thank you very much so so one of the stuff motion obviously if you look at tapering that's a typical old model schooled periodization table where we used to say if you look at the beginning of the season you'll start with high volume and you'll start with low intensity but like i said that's very difficult if you work with a team of 40 players because each one has a different value a different intensity different fitness level so what we do we follow more specifically we follow a two factor concept now have you heard of the two factor model so the two factor model very simply state is if i know what the demands of the game is i need to pre season or ill off season condition my athletes to the requirements of the game so for instance so if, so if we know in a game that we're going to run 500 meters at high intensity we will start our first training session with that intensity and volume so that the athletes adapt to the strenuous activities required for a game i hope it makes sense so it means when they get in season we can't say and especially when we look at super rugby we can't pick a game and say okay we want to win that game and win that game and win this game we want to win every game so in a week module if you follow that games model that we spoke about we want to make sure that intensity speed frequency and load is optimal for the game requirements so we don't taper to give an idea um what we do is we do undulate so we have certain weeks that we do less in intensity for the whole week for the athletes but we don't say we taper because at the end of the day we still want to peak at the final does that make sense Yes, so tapering is, mm -hmm. is obviously something of the future and then obviously with specifically in, in overload we obviously because we start on intensity pre-season we condition our athletes to take the demand of the game from the start so when they are in season they actually used to they conditioned to take the load required for the game every saturday does it make sense so the old yes, model of periodization and following 
low volume and high intensity, that's it's it's easy if it's an individual athletic like tennis player. But in a rugby game, it's too difficult to monitor. So we follow different models. So we start with high volume, high intensity, but obviously we keep the increments pre-season very small. So for instance, our training session, if we look at speed, I can talk about speed. We have like a 15 minute speed block, but we do it every day. At the highest intensity, the volume required. So when we're in season, we still have a speed block, but the speed block may be five minutes. At the intensity and volume required, so your tapering model that you're talking about, but it's still done every day, right up to the day of our final. Does it make sense? So the athletes, actually, that's what conditioning is. Conditioning is getting them used to the demands of the game at the right force, velocity, and intensity required so that we don't need to peak. We want to peak every game and still win the final. See, there was another question. Uh, can you yeah. touch on tapering and unload? Peter? Okay, Richard, I think I just answered that question. Yes, who's next? Uh, Leonard. Leonard here. Yes, Leonard. Uh, uh, this is Leonard from Uganda, uh, yes. head coach national team women. Excellent. So my, 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 my question is, uh, uh, as we, we've been through this uh, pandemic, coronavirus, it's been about four months, no, three months down the road, no action of rugby. Yes. So as we return to play, do we check it? Or do we take the, the pandemic period as a, an off season? Because uh, the leagues have been going on and uh, they've been cut short. They weren't completed. Yeah. So as we're returning back to play, do we take the COVID-19 period as, a, as an off season? And then we have to readjust to uh, probably, we may be given three weeks to uh, probably sure. uh, adjust to the fitness, uh, uh, the, the yeah. demands of the game. And uh, what, what approach, best approach uh, would you advise? Is it high volume? low intensity just to get the players into shape. Thank yeah. you. The, the problem, Leonard, is maybe it start off, I think this is a new normal. I think we're all in the same boat. So I hear you that there's a pandemic made it hard for us all to condition. But we I can only tell you what we've done, Leonard. So we've obviously given our athletes like this virtual sessions. We've given them off season training programs that they obviously need to do wherever they are and if it's possible. The big element that is our concern is obviously strength training because not all of them have a gym or equipment at a gym. So strength is a major issue and obviously that could lead to major injuries. So my first advice to be is, is give them remote pro training programs that they can do now even before you start. Then on your question about intensity, if you've got only two weeks, then my goal will be is still smaller, like an off season, smaller increments, maybe three to four training sessions a day Obviously, incorporate with that, that make sure that your recovery is optimal. And what we've now kindly have done is we've obviously go to a 10-week cycle, not a seven-week cycle. Because we've got about four weeks of training, we've got to go for 10 days, non-stop training, and then obviously undulate for two, three days to get a better value. So your weekly schedule is not five increments now. We've allocated our sessions to 10-week cycles. But an SNC coach, if he sits down with you, maybe you must get my number and I'll help you to sit it down. We have broken our sessions up for a little bit longer increments so we can get a better value. We will obviously make sure that our recovery is optimal, but our intensity is game related from day one. And the way we do that is by short, small games. So when we do have a training session, obviously we manipulate our work rest so that the work rest simulates our game response. And then obviously we focus on a lot of recovery so that if we train two to three times a day, that we recover well enough that each session is optimal. And obviously that there's enough recovery allocated for the next session and obviously for the week. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. And lastly, Nenel, I don't know, do you have an SMC coach that kindly that helps you to structure your, your periodization for your team? Uh, yes, I do have. I do have one. You can, you can freely just give him my details and I'd love to sit with him and, and just discuss with him um, some concept that you obviously use and maybe, maybe we can help you guys. All right. Thank you so much, Peter. Pleasure.
There's another question. Kindly touch on typing. Someone else said, okay, there's another one. We did typing on loading. A civic amount of rugby players in Kenya is introduced to rugby in, in high school. What would you recommend as the key things you need to do to be the same level as others? So, so I think um, this was from someone private. So if an athlete is a late developer or maybe only starts rugby on a late to later age, I think the big thing that will, my question first will be as to what sports did they play before they played rugby? If it was a type of contact sport, obviously it's much easier. If it was an individual sport like athletics, I think the major things they need to adapt to is obviously collisions. So for us, what we incorporate for those athletes is obviously in the SNC department, we will get them into wrestling. And part of the strength training for those athletes, we'll, we'll get a wrestling coach. And we have kindly for all our juniors. So at least two to three times a week as part of our conditioning is a wrestling element to make sure that they can know how to make contact, they know to help to take people down, and obviously how to compete when there's collisions in a game. And then obviously we need to take them through regimen to teach them how to make contact. So obviously teach them like you do a fundamental phase, teach them on the knees, teach them how to make contact, where do I put my head? Because I think contact obviously in tackles and collisions it is the very major issue for those athletes who return or only stay at high school. Um, and then the second bit I'll add to that is obviously depends on if they were sportsmen before that, but strength training, uh, you can't take that away. They need to get into a gym. They need to get to an expert that can teach them the right techniques. And obviously they need to get into a strength regime to make sure that they can handle the forces required. I don't know who the private guy was. I hope that answered your question. Uh, Peter. Yes. One quick one here. I'm uh, with yes. one of my uh, my club assistant coaches, and he know, he coaches also in high school. Yes. So one quick question he asked me uh, to ask you is, uh, what is there a certain level of uh, of volume, like for example, weight weight training in the gyms? Is there a certain limit to weight training for high school players? Since they are probably uh, the biggest number of them are between the age of 15 and 18. Yeah, the, 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 the thing is, Leonard, then I will maybe answer the question with a question is, if you take a, a junior athlete or any athlete and you think about running, just running outside, if you're running flat out outside, the forces applied to your body on one leg is about yeah. two and a half times his body weight on one leg, yeah. obviously, because you're only running on one leg. Mm -hmm. so, so strength training is a vital component to get the body... Um, almost ready for performance. But there's a huge difference between a bodybuilder training program and a sport conditioning program. When we think about sport conditioning, we think about full range of movements. We think about power application. We think about landing, so not just jumping. We think about handling force. And obviously, we think about kinetic linking. How do we link the body so that what we do in the gym has a carryover so that it be performance outside on the field is similar. So yes, um, as a high school level, I will definitely say strength training is important. Not uh, Again, I'll, it's just not gym training. Strength training is important. But if you have an expert who can help you, there's resistance training, there's TRX, there's Vipers, there's kettlebells, there's Indian clubs. There's so many stuff out there that you can utilize to help your athletes to help in their performance. And those only include strength training. It's not just in the gym with heavy weights. Um, there's a variety of activities you can do that strengthen them to optimize their performance. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you so much. Anyone else? Yeah, um, Peter, Philip here. Yes, I think I, I sent you. I sent you my question on on the chat. Probably. Oh, sorry. Let me is, let me just check. Was it you that spoke about the? Uh, which one is it, Philip? Uh, Peter, what, what's the best way to optimize a speed block progression? In what stage the program? A lot of SNC programs don't have speed limits. Sure, Philip. Uh, like I said, I can keep you here for a day about speed. So if you look about speed in our our discussion and just for your sake obviously in, in rugby there's four elements of speed that i'll say firstly there's a straight line speed okay is that ability so 
Um, then obviously in the ability of a straight line, they need to be able to start well, they need to be able to stop well, they need to be accelerate well, and obviously they need to have absolute speed. That's just, just in a straight line. And then in multi-directional, that's changing direction, is something totally different that needs to be trained because obviously we don't run a straight line. And then obviously response training. So what I see actually has a major influence on my response in training. So it doesn't mean I can step and I can guide, but if I do it, there's no one there, it doesn't help. Right? So just to say, firstly, I think there's a few elements in speed. But to answer your question is, what we do is I'd rather have a small increment of speed every training session. So if we go out on the field, we will use a warm up to do mechanical work. So, so if it's a straight line, I'll do mechanical work to work on starts. We'll have an integrated session that I know the force and speed necessary to effectively improve starts will be integrated into that 15 minute slots. And then if there's individuals who have specific requirements, we'll do it after the training session. If it, the intensity was not great enough and we obviously didn't achieve our distances, we will do extra speed on top of the sessions to bulk it up. So either small increments, four to five times out of, out of a week, uh, we just feel is better than one session standing alone with 45 minutes of speed. I don't know if that helps, Philip. Philip? Philip? Yes, yes, I can does, hear does you. It, does that answer your question? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Uh, Peter? Yes. Peter? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Moto, can you hear? Okay, possibly the last question from me. Um, no, now fine. that some of us, yeah, now that some of us also deals with the age grade that is under 15 and also under 13, now do you have recommended uh, age for introducing them to the, the weight. Remember, we've been doing mostly the calisthenics exercises. Now, do mm -hmm. you have the recommended age for us to re, uh, maybe, uh, the, for us to take them through the weight uh, lifting? Thank you, that's one. Yeah, possibly you can answer that. Yeah, so just to, more to, just to answer, I don't think that weight lifting, especially if you look at weights in a gym, should only be referenced only to 15 year old kids. If an athlete has to do with what we call a training age, if he starts with an expert and he takes him through training schedules and monitoring his patterns of movement, you can start very early. So kinesthetics is a great way to teach the movement, but obviously you need to apply force. He's, not, he's running outside, so it means the force is applied is already major. And he doesn't start to play rugby at 15, he starts to play rugby when they're very young. So what we normally do is we work if we go earlier ages, we work a percentage of his body weight. So for upper body, we'll say between 15 and 25 as a start of a, as a percentage of his body weight, and then 30 to 40% as a percentage of his body weight to start off with when they're younger, and work it up up until they can do use their own body weight. And normally our, our ratio is because there's a limit to strength training, especially for athletes. So if he can reach a limit to about 1.25 his upper body strength, and obviously he can do right about 1.5 to two times his body weight and lower strength activities, then we'll start with other modalities like plyometrics and Olympic lifting to increase the rate and force production for the athlete. So age is an important question, but you can start early. You just need to know what to do. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Well answered. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, just a comment to yes. Mr. Motor Williams and everyone else inside uh, in this Zoom meeting. Our world rugby has changed the approach towards SNC, and now they are, they are offering courses in regards to SNC for children. Then we are moving to SNC for youth, then SNC for adults. So, as uh, Peter said, uh, age is not a limiting factor. No. Not at all. And, and on that, George, obviously the world passport gives you good education of, of the basic fundamentals. But I think it's also important that you practically need to know how to apply it. 
there's a huge difference between education and a practical application of that education. So it's always good to sit with someone who's got the experience um, and can guide you through the process. Like I said, they won't tell you that you can use 30% more or 20%. You need to first to evaluate your athletes, look at their FMS scores, look at their what we call fundamental capacity screen. So how, what is their movement literacy? And then we'll say, okay, cool, let's adapt their training programs according to their chronological, biological, and emotional age. Very true. Okay. Any other questions, gentlemen? Sure, it seems like that's it, George. Is there anything from your side? Uh, nothing. I just want to say a big thank you to you and uh, Weather for the presentation and uh, for your time. Uh, again, I want to give credit to Jason who made us link up. Uh, the other party is uh, the guys from Zambia, Uganda. Welcome. Kenyans, Karibu Sana. Thank you so much. Uh, Peter, Weather, as much as Jason will tell you, Karibu Sana is. Uh, you are most welcome to do this again, and uh, we hope it will be as enlightening as this one. Such Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, George. I'd love to come and present a little bit more. And obviously, we can maybe go into depth about how we develop speed. That's obviously yes. uh, my, my passion and my dream. So I'd love to talk to you guys a little bit more. And thanks for the opportunities. Thanks for the invite. Uh, please, uh, George, you can send my personal email um, to the, the delegates and the staff and the people. We would love to help you in your endeavor. Um, and I think the, the, the my last uh, note of everyone is obviously we do this because we've got a heart for sport and a passion for our athletes. And um, I hope that stays our dream, that it never becomes about us, but obviously how we can make our athletes better. So it's thank for the time and opportunity. Um, um, it was a great pleasure for me to pre present for all of you guys. Okay, uh, thank you, and you're welcome to do this again. Just before guys log out, let me send you the his personal email so that you can save it. Just for a bit. Uh, Jason? Yes. Anything? Uh, nothing else from our side. Um, <laughs> where I was here on the side here. So guys, thank you very much. It was wonderful to meet all of you. Um, and obviously I share Peter's passion for for developing you guys as coaches. You know, I, um, I've been in the, the education game with coaches for the past 25 years. And um, Peter and I is very much on the same page that developing coaches is where the, the improvement of our players will be. You know, And I think all of you, you, you in this game to constantly learn and constantly improve yourself. And the day you stop learning as a coach or as a strength and conditioning trainer is the day that you're going to be you're going to be taken out, if I can put it to you that way. <laughs> you, you need to constantly improve yourself. And what we're doing with Sports Coach Global and with ETA College as our partner, who, su who supports us, is that um, we would obviously create as many opportunities as possible for guys to improve themselves and get better at their skill set of improving athletes. And obviously with this lockdown at the moment, pictures noticed, yeah, lockdown gives us that time. You know, we have this time now to spend some time together so let's use it the best we can and obviously share as much with you as we can so that you can go back when you're on that field that you actually blow your athletes and players away thank you Wesson. pleasure thank you gentlemen have a blessed evening thank you yeah. bye 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 thank you thank so you much George. peter we'll link thank up you, thank you bye bye cheers Pete. Cheers, bro. Thanks, sir. I cheers. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you all, sir. Asadi Sana Jason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.